let, let's go ahead and start. I think a few more people will still drift in, but let's go ahead and start. Um, so as preliminaries, um, so I've asked Les to speak for about 35 to 40 minutes, but he's open to questions, which are probably best done by posting to the chat windows and I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt the talk uh, as, I see, as I see fit. Um, and uh, if you do post questions to the chat windows, reminder, please post them to be visible to both panelists and attendees so that everyone can see them. And if you're an attendee and want to get promoted to panelist, please just raise your hand and one of us will promote you. Um, and uh, with the practical matters out of the way, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Le Leslie Valiant here as the speaker. Um, Les is very well known for many contributions. I should mention especially uh, the introduction of the concept of sharp P completeness and uh, PAC learning, and uh, of course, many other contributions in algebraic complexity and, and circuit complexity and other areas as well. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Les. He's speaking on complexity and diversity. Okay, well, th thank you very much for the invitation. So the uh, talk is about uh, uh, complexity and its relationship to a uh, combinatorial property, which I call functional diversity. And this is ongoing work with Ben Edelman, who is a student at, at Harvard. Um, so, uh, so if we want to understand computational complexity, the very starting point, and I think your program is, is about uh, SAT, so it celebrates the P equals NP question, and rightly so, because that was the first formulation of uh, this class of problems about uh, natural completeness classes. Um, so that's uh, certainly one thing one can uh, work on to understand complexity. So another thing one can work on, which uh, I've uh, much tried to promote is, is working on algebraic uh, versions of this, like the permanent versus the determinant. And the argument here is that um, if you believe in negative results, then uh, these should be easier to prove than P not equal to NP. And also that, that there's a wealth of potential approaches to this, which are algebraic, geometric, and many approaches which in the Boolean world uh, maybe do not exist. But this talk is motivated by an intermediate uh, question, which um, is about working on, on more modular counting. So the question is whether uh, the analog of NP, where you count the number of solutions modular, say prime number Q, um, um, how the complete problems for that relate to P. And, uh, and uh, complete problems for, for this are, um, um, NP, NP is reducible to complete problems in these. Now the, uh, Re reason for my interest in this uh, is that um, mainly that there are some opportunities for negative results, which don't seem to appear in the other two formulations. <clears throat> in particular, <clears throat> at least for a restricted model, there is a low bound, bound argument, which I've uh, been you know, interested in for a long time. <laughs> um, and uh, and its main uh, attraction is that it's very simple. It's a classical mix of algebra and counting. And it's there, it's available. Um, it's useful in this domain of a, of a restricted model. And uh, um, you know, so, so just the availability of a lower bound ar argument, which isn't available anywhere else, I think is the main attraction for this. And uh, this notion of uh, functional diversity is the way to um, approach it. Okay, so, so functional diversity is a very classical looking uh, property. Um, it's basically how many sub functions a function has. So if I give you a function of, uh, um, of m arguments, and uh, we can look at the Boolean case, uh, or other cases, but if say a and b are, 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 are finite, um, the issue is um, if I fix a uh, domain of the of the uh, of the variables, say the first n, uh, how many subfunctions, how many functions, how many subfunctions does f have of the first n variables if I fix the remaining variables? And uh, so this is uh, very classical because uh, 
it goes back at least to Nechi Peruk in 1963, who, who proved um, lower bounds on Boolean formula complexity based on essentially this uh, property, except that, um, so he had, he uh, partitioned the, the variables, formed a partition maybe into root n sets of root n, and then found the uh, average number of subfunctions you can get of this set of root n as you vary the other the remaining variables. Whereas um, here I'm just looking at the worst case. You know, is 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 there a set of uh, variables maybe log n, which has a lot of um, um, which has a lot, lot of subfunctions on it as you vary the remaining variables. Um, so, of course, Nechi Peruk could prove lower bound up to about quadratic size for formula size this way. Um, so, just to um, pin down the definition uh, slightly more. Um, so, I've got, a, I've got a function, um, usually, I've got a function. And I have a, what I call a domain, a subset of the variables of size n. And then the diversity of, of this domain, this subset of the variables in f, will be the logarithm to the base 2, the number of different functions of, the, uh, of, the, of these variables as we fix the remaining uh, variables. OK. And uh, so then we say that the n diversity um, of uh, of f is the worst case is for, is for the worst case domain d of size n. Um, okay, so um, so each domain may uh, have different number of, of subfunctions on it, and among the domains of so say log n size, uh, which is the domain which has the most functions on it. Um, and then we say that a function family um, has, um, say, polynomial diversity if um, the n diversities of its members are upper bounded by some polynomial. So, so number of functions. This says the number of functions you can get on a domain of size n is um, the most single exponential in the in the n. Okay, so the the domains of size n, the function may have n variables. So at this point, uh, I'm not even telling you know the uh, the uh, there's no bound on how many variables um, the function may have. But in fact, the useful version is that I talk about standard diversity if the um, um, number of variables is at most single exponential in this domain. Otherwise, it starts losing interest. Um, and so the way uh, this is a general, very classical uh, a Boolean property. Um, the way it will become interesting is that um, is if you put some restrictions. So I'll have some sort of uh, planar structure, and these variables will occur on the outer periphery. And that's the context in which one can prove useful things about this. Um, but just for a second, let's just forget about this and just look at this as some basic func basic uh, property of Boolean functions. Um, well, um, the obvious observations are that some easy functions do have exponential diversity, and namely, um, which you get from the fact that there are double exponentially many Boolean functions. So if you have a um, a string of uh, n plus 2 to the n bits, and the first n bits are the variables, and the remaining 2 to the n bits specify the truth table for a Boolean function, f, um, then by, um, so that the ith um, bit in this tail is the value of, um, of the Boolean function at the ith value of, uh, of uh, 0, 1 to the n. This is just a generic Boolean uh, truth table. Since they're two to, two to the n Boolean functions, um, you can represent every Boolean function 
like this. So, um, so on the first log n bits, um, you can have uh, double exponential many functions, which means it's got exponential diversity. Okay. And an equivalent thing is, is the circuit value problem. But then instead of have specifying the Boolean function by a table, we specify it by um, description of a circuit. And some slightly more natural problems also encode uh, these tables. So for example, context-free recognition also has high diversity. Um, again, this goes back to early investigations of uh, related Nechebrook's um, ideas, is that if you've got a context-free language where you've got a, a string and a constant, a string and a constant, um, and the question is whether the first string is found somewhere else um, in, in one of the other Ws, then um, this is in reverse, um, then this is a context-free language because you can put this into a stack and then non-deterministically go anywhere and check whether whether the some other W is the same thing in reverse. Um, but with this, you can you can program in exactly this Boolean function value problem. You you list all the Ws which uh, for which the function is one. Okay, so some fun functions are of exponential diversity. Um, in fact, uh, I, I, these are simple, but you know I don't really know a good argue, a, a different argument for proving functions to, to be well, exponential diversity, or I'm sure many are. Um, and so, basic theme will be: Can this be computed by linear algebra? Um, so, um, some functions are of low diversity um, parity. Um, you know, so if you have a number of variables at the beginning, the dependence on the remaining variables is just one bit of information. Um, a graph connectivity, a similar kind of thing that if you've got um, in the right representation, um, the if you look at a small part of the graph, the information which you need about the enormous unseen part of the graph is just polynomial. polynomial number of bits of information about the connectivity it imposes. And then a, a few other things which you can find in the literature. So for example, uh, 2CNF has a similar property that if you have got some enormous 2CNF formula, then um, the number of functions you can make up of, of it is, is bounded uh, in a similar way. Okay. Um, Okay, so, um, but as a general uh, Boolean function, uh, uh, um, this, the, the diversity of Boolean functions is highly um, representation uh, dependent. So this is uh, an observation of Ben Adelman that um, any Boolean function you can recode um, to have polynomial in polynomial time to have linear diversity. And um, I see pa Pavel Pudlak in the audience. So this is a, a simplification of an idea he once proposed to me a long time ago. And the construction, uh, so Ben's construction is simply that, um, um, so if you have a, say, say function of, of high diversity, then if you simply uh, repeat the input, um, if, you, if you've got an input of size uh, k and re you repeat it k times, um, and the function you give value zero, if, if the input isn't a repetition exactly k times of, of an input, then this will, allow the, this will make the function have low diversity. Um, okay, so... Um, so what I'm saying here is that, uh, so if you've got a function f sub, uh, um, well, okay, so the, yeah, so so basically, to, 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 if you've got an arbitrary problem, like an NP complete problem, 
if you repeat the input k times, if you repeat the input of size k k times, and for instances which inputs which don't have that representation, you give the value zero, then um, this will be a function of the same complexity as your previous one. But in fact, you can show that this diversity is uh, destroyed. Okay, so um, okay, so um, so I've got this very simple function property, which is in fact rather brittle as far as representation. So what is it? What is it useful for? Of course, another warning is that from Rasborough Rudich, our argument is that we shouldn't look for, um, to, you shouldn't expect too much as far as complexity uh, from, sim from explicit Boolean functions. And that's true. But so here I'll use it as some sort of thinking tool for analyzing the power of computational methods. And just another throwaway comment is that. Um, Another kind of motivation for these kind of properties is that uh, there are certain counting dichotomies, which are important results obtained in the last uh, um, decade or so, the complexity dichotomies. And it's always an interesting question whether these dichotomies coincide with some simple combinatorial property and, and don't need to be expressed in terms of computation. Um, Okay, so um, so the main point here is that there is a lower bound, bound argument somewhere. And uh, the lower bound argument is a simple combination of counting, which is simply as in Shannon, when he showed that some, most Boolean functions are, are, are high complexity. And the other aspect of these proofs is that it's simple linear algebra. And these are, by linear algebra, I mean, the grassman Pluker or Matchgate identities, which I'll come to in a second. And so just to explain the algebra that's used. So the idea simply is that if you have a matrix, then um, you can talk about subsets of the rows and subsets of the columns. So S and T will be subsets of rows and columns. And uh, X of S comma T will be a determinant. Uh, will be the determinant of, of this matrix with these rows and columns de deleted. Okay, so given a matrix, this is a notation for talking about the determinants of submatrices. Um, and on these sub on these subdeterminants of, of a matrix, uh, there are some identities. Okay, so a, a, a trivial one for this is that, so this means that so this means that this is a matrix X with no rows and no columns uh, deleted. So this means the determinant of this matrix. This means uh, all the rows and all the columns uh, deleted. And uh, this is one. So this is the determinant of this matrix is equal to. And of course, this is if you delete row one and row two, you get just, just, just this element. So you can imagine you can make up a, just the formula for the de determinant of a two by two matrix gives you a, um, an identity in the axis. But okay. well, it turns out that uh, there's a plethora of identities or matrices and the Grassmann and Plucker relations, you should look at, you've got a matrix and, and N is some is the number of rows and columns you select. We could pick n, n equal to three. And these relations will relate uh, the determinants of submatrices of these, which you get by deleting subsets of the first three rows and columns. Okay, so n is the uh, rows and columns which you select from to, to delete. And then the matrix, matrix can be of any size. And so you do get an exponential number of such identities in terms of the n. And the interesting thing is that these identities hold independent, independent for all matrices. So these uh, other, you know, the size of the matrix doesn't even enter. So uh, subdeterminants of sub subdeterminants of matrices have very uh, lots of identities. Um, now, for us, this is uh, 
a constraint. So we like determinants because we can compute them easily, but all these relations are an impediment to how expressive they are. Um, so in holographic algorithms, we attempt to build gates uh, with the properties of, the, uh, of these identities, um, which I'll show in a second. Um, and uh, so unfortunately, the grasp on Pruke identities relate to the actual subdeterminants. But um, for using them for holographic algorithms, we don't get exactly subdeterminants. We'll get subdeterminants, but they all have different different signs. So the signs are messed up. Uh, but fortunately, um, these uh, the way the signs are messed up um, can be compensated for because um, the subdeterminants we need with the change signs with change signs, as it turns out. Uh, hold similar properties. And these are called the match gate identities. And the uh, last word on, on them is this paper by Tsai and Gorenstein, uh, which uh, is the result of a long sequence of, of uh, previous papers. OK, so the um, so linear algebra type, type constraints hold um, for these things. Okay, so just to remind you what these match gates are. So the idea is that we'll, sim we'll simulate uh, Boolean properties by bits of linear algebra. So this is a little graph, it will be a gate. And um, this, is, this is the adjacency matrix. No, sorry, sorry, this is not the adjacency matrix, no, sorry. Um, so what we're interested in is the matching polynomial of this, uh, of this, of this graph. Um, so, for example, um, x. So, a matching polynomial is is the, just a product of all the. Um, it's, it's like a. It's a product. Is is the sum of raw matchings of the product of the weights of the matchings. So, for for example, for this whole matrix, um, you can have this edge and this edge. The weights are AC, A times C. This edge and this edge. The weights are DB. And so this is the um, matching polynomial um, for the whole matrix, for the whole graph. So this matrix um, we do by looking at this, what we call a gate. And um, this, is, this, this indicates whether we want to include or exclude the edges on these input edges and the output edges. So these are the input edges, these are the output edges. So 0, 0, 0, 0 means that these edges will, have an, uh, will not be matched. So in a complete matching of the graph, you'll have to match the four vertices internally. That's why you've got A, C, B, D. Whereas, for example, this X23 says that you'll match the bottom of the inputs and the top of the outputs. So if you match the bottom of the input and the top of the output, then you, so you need this edge E to match the other vertices. That's where X23 will be E. Okay, so, uh, so this matrix is like a matrix of subdeterminants. Uh, if I may uh, skip one or two, uh, nice it is. And we want to capture Boolean properties by relations of, of these, of these uh, values that we get. Okay, um, that, that's how we get Boolean properties. Um, these are the different terms. Um, so the goal is that when we assemble lots of these match gates, then uh, we want to be left with a simple de determinant computation, which will count for, for you the number of answers. So the goal is all we can do is compute determinants. Our goal is to compute a big determinant at the end. The hard part is to make up a, a big graph where the determinant is, uh, is of interest. Um, and uh, so when assembling these gates, there is a sign problem. Um, and, uh, and this is this connection between um, um, these match gates, which you have a problem you have to overcome, but can be overcome. 
And uh, just to mention that, so sometimes in holographic algorithms, one uses this KFT method, the idea that for planar graphs, um, you can put directions on the edges so that in effect, you make all the components of the perfect matching polynomial positive. That's one approach. Another approach is, is somehow you work directly with the raw linear algebra, and you manage the signs uh, directly. Um, but in either case, you've got this problem of um, that you, you try to model gates, Boolean properties of gates using uh, bits of this uh, perfect matching polynomial, but to put them together, there's some sign issues. Okay, so- um, Les, if I could ask a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, just on the previous slide, just a simple question. Wanted to make sure I understood correctly the way those perfect matching polynomials are working. You're, you're sort of thinking, it's almost like you have a gadget. You have this, you're, you're talking about the ways of matching the things on the left to the things on the right. And those are being the entries in the, in, in the matrix then. Um, yeah, so exactly, this is a gadget. And then you'll have lots of, you put your big graph, you'll have lots of these gadgets. And you want the perfect matching polynomial of the whole thing to equal what you want to compute it. And, and uh, these will represent the, bo the Boolean properties of, of the gates or properties of the, of the gates. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. So then um, in the end, you get, you finish up with some, some big graph. Which, so match grid is like a, it's, it's, it's a huge gate, one, one which computes value to your problem. So in the end, you get a big graph with some values on the edges and you want to compute the matching polynomial of this. Okay. Um, so that's what you get to by composing all this. And so basic question is, um, well, can one compute NP complete, NP complete problems this way? So for example, you can do satisfiability or planar satisfiability, want to count the number of solutions, maybe modulo K, uh, modulo Q, a prime number. And of course, all these are NP hard and sharp complete problems. So can, so can we do this? Um, well, the answer is that, um, so what's provable, and this is this low bound argument I've been trying to emphasize, is that if the reduction um, is, is what I call elementary, it's, a, it's, it's suitably constrained, then we can prove by the simple argument that this um, is not possible. Um, so you can't prove NP complete, NP complete problems by this uh, simplest uh, method. Um, and uh, so essentially what elementary means, so it means it's, it's a carp reduction. So from your problem, so for example, you have a plain uh, satisfiability problem and you, in each uh, gadget in your plain uh, satisfiability problem, you have a gadget here and you hope that the determinant of the whole thing will um, solve your MP complete problem for you. Um, so elementary means that um, in this, so it's a property of, of the reduction. Um, so it means essentially that you do the obvious things that each, each um, component of your SAT uh, problem, you map to a, to a local gate um, of the type I've mentioned. Um, so the main the main restriction is that it's it, the mapping is um, from is, is kind of local that each part of the of the um, of the circuit or formula you're mapping goes to some local or formula in your match gate. Okay, so um, okay, so the definition of of elementary is is slightly messy, but it's. Uh, you know, it does capture what, what's needed, I believe. And for these, um, one can show using um, a combination of counting and, uh, and this uh, linear algebra that no, these direct uh, one-shot evaluations of, of a determinant will not solve any complete problems for you. Okay. And uh, the um, okay, and it's so it's important that we 
we count that we do mod counting because that makes it that restricts the number of possible functions. So that's important for the counting, and the um, and we do need uh, the algebra. So the algebra, the the match gate identities are what we need to constrain the idea that um, if you've got a bit of your circuit here and some enormous part of the of, of the rest of the circuit, there comes some constraints on what this rest of the circuit can contribute to the problem you are trying to solve. If the problem you're trying to solve has has high diversity, okay. Okay, so that's kind of what you'd expect. Um, but then the issue is that um, the next step up, so this is the first idea of solving NP-complete problems by linear algebra doesn't work, but the second step is open. So what's the second possible step? Well, what if we allow a Cook reductions in a particular way? And basically we want Cook reductions to, to do polynomial interpolation. So by polynomial interpolation, I mean that in this uh, match grid, I do exactly as I did before, but on some of the um, edges, I put a indeterminate z. And then, if I want to compute an instance of this problem of size, uh, say n size m, so I've got a Boolean for, plain and Boolean formula of size m. I draw, I construct a huge one of these somehow, size m squared maybe. And so then this will compute a polynomial in Z. And maybe a coefficient of this polynomial in Z will give me the answer. So interpolation is a, um, you know, a very basic tool used in, in translating counting problems. Um, um, so, so, so in like Sharpie completeness proofs, you know, you use gadgets, you use some of the holographic reductions, but the third main technique is, is interpolation. So it's a very powerful tool from going from one counting problem to, to, uh, to another. Okay. Um, so anyway, so the question is, you know, can one prove, uh, you know, satisfiability mod Q, which is of course MP hard, um, to be hard by simply constructing a simple, uh, a single match grid in this indeterminate Z and computing a coefficient of, of z uh, and hoping that that's the answer. And this is, uh, this is open. Um, and one would think that there's some simple proof that this doesn't work, but um, there is an interesting construction of uh, Jin Yi Tsai, which uh, shows that uh, it's not, it may not be so easy to prove that this doesn't work because interpolation does give you something in this context. Okay, so, so that's the um, main message. Um, so there's a problem here. Um, so, okay, so if I, not sure, a couple more minutes. Okay, so that's the main point. Um, so then the only other thing I want to emphasize is that, um, okay, two, two more things. One is that although proving high diversity, um, sound trivial with these uh, problems compete for P. In fact, for, for many problems, it's, you know, I don't have any techniques for showing high diversity, except somehow for showing that these uh, um, P complete problems are, are hidden inside. And the kind of problems of interest uh, would be these plain, uh, these, these very simple counting problems, which are on the boundary of being easy and hard. And so this is this, um, um, notation for expressing uh, combinatorial, combinatorial properties. So the easing problem. So this says that your problem is made up of, of components where, um, um, so these are like, this is like a degree three vertex and, um, and the three signals being sent out, are either the, that none of, none of them are, are, are ones or all of them are ones. So the various positions here count how many of the of the outputs are ones, um, and so this is an easing problem. Means that if uh, so, so this strip models the edges. Um, so if the two edge ends have different values, then you have a value c. If they're the same, they have value one. Um, so this is an 
eating problem. And in general, we don't know whether these have high or low diversity, um, except for very odd, odd places, for very odd values of, of, the, of this constant. One can show it by essentially showing that you can map the one of these uh, circuit value problems into it. Um, and similarly for like planar matchings, uh, you'd like to show no know whether it's got high or low complexity, high or low diversity. But again, it can it can be shown, for example, for some very odd uh, fields of size nineteen, for example. Again, because you can by accident map complete problems in. Anyway, so that's not so. The main point is that there's big this big open problem. But just as a to finish off the philosophical note on holographic algorithms. Um, um, so, okay, so this is saying that traditional complexity, what do, what do we do? When traditional complexity, we build things up. We have uh, AND gates, all gates, NOT gates, fan out, and we see what we can make out of these components. But then at the end, we say, oh, we've got this big problem of non-determinism, non and what on earth do we do about that? Okay, so in holographic algorithms, we, we reverse this. So we say, well, we want to do. We want to be able to solve non-determinism. So we build in linear algebra, which does solve a kind of non-determinism. But then, what we're left with is saying, well, what can we build up inside it? What functionality can we do non-determinism over? And uh, um, maybe it's not surprising that, of course, we can't. Uh, if we if we could simulate all of standard computation, then we could prove p equals np. But we can't, so we try to see what fragment of of this we can simulate, and so perhaps it's not surprising that this basic capability of doing um, of doing you know deterministic computation, the circuit value problem is kind of a is critical. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, great, very interesting talk, uh, and let me I'm. I'm going to clap on behalf of everybody here since they can't clap and uh, want to open the floor to, to, to questions and so on. Um, I, maybe while people are for, formulating their questions, let me just ask you, you, would, you talked about holographic al algorithms, uh, but didn't really define them. Do you want to say a few words about what they are for? Well, I, I, I just kind of, uh, well, there, there, there are many, uh, facets uh, to them. Uh, um, well, one way of looking at them is what I tried to explain that um, the basic uh, the, at, 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 it depends where you start. Uh, at one level, the, this holographic idea is is an idea about about uh, reductions. Okay, and uh, um, but here I've emphasized that if you want to use them for use for useful algorithms, when you reduce, you better start with something you know how to do. So in this case, you start with um, a linear algebra because there are fast algorithms for it. And in a particular, uh, using linear algebra for solving uh, a planar, certain planar problems like the um, um, FKT algorithm for perfect matching in the planar graphs is a, is a good way to start. So that, that's how I... Uh, I refer to it. Okay, so there, there are very various ways in which you can uh, present holographic algorithms. I kind of hinted at one. Right. Okay. And and how important is the planarity property? Um. So. Um, okay. So, um, so um, okay, so in, so the basic uh, question that if you want to reduce things to linear algebra, you know you have to you have to model the individual individual gates, and then you have to put them together. So that's it. When you've done all that, it's still linear algebra. Um, so uh, so one one of the two approaches which I mentioned is this is using this uh, known uh, fact that um, planar uh, perfect matchings you can do in polynomial time. So this, so in the planar case, uh, Castellane 50 years ago gave a method for 
make for making the composition of the gates automatic. Okay, so planar is important if you want to use this method of of, of doing the composition in a kind of automated way. Um, but in the end, uh, what you're always doing is linear algebra, and it's actually it's you're working through Fafians. So the other approach is to uh, use Fafians directly. Um, and in, in that case, it's you have to handle the uh, signs. So in that case, you don't have to say anything is planar. But uh, in the end, the kind of things you do uh, are largely equivalent. OK, so, so in the end, ultimately, the two approaches look very similar. So whether this only works for planar structures or not is a um, isn't totally clear, but at, at, at some, from some bird's eye view, um, uh, maybe yes, but, but maybe no. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so let me, let me open the floor to general questions. Uh, either post questions into the chat windows if you wish, and I'll read them back, or just un unmute yourself and uh, ask a question is fine too. So. Uh, encourage some questions or comments. So um, I, I may have missed it. So, so you going back to this uh, page with the, the different kinds of reductions and uh, your uh, open question, uh, your big open question. Um, I, I, why is the, I, I, why is the diversity, this polynomial uh, diversity versus exponential diversity. Exactly why, how does sort of on a technical level is that connection uh, work with the, with the model? Uh, um, well, it's, it's uh, um, at an intuitive level, really, more yeah, than. Yeah, so it's, um, um, So, so, so basically, it's if you, this initial picture that you've got your few inputs, and potentially, so if you if hidden away there's a circuit value problem there, and 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 the function of these uh, say n inputs could be any of double exponentially many, then the problem is that the way these n inputs are connected to the rest of your problem. Um, is is it has a like a bottleneck in it. So linear algebra is like a bottleneck. It it rest restricts the way you can communicate to this log n inputs. Ah, I see. I see. And and that doesn't follow in carp. Uh, sorry, in the Cook reduction context, that intuition fails in that context. Uh, for for I. Well, oh. what's the reason for that? Yeah. Well, the proof the proof the proof fails. Um, um, well, 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 because um, one thing is that once once you uh, do a Cook reduction, then effectively you 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 you, you, re you repeat the inputs uh, lots of times. So they look, you haven't localized the inputs anymore. I see. So that that argument that that linear uh, diversity argument that uh, Ben Edmonds that you uh, reference would essentially come into play. Right, right, right. So, so the whole, uh, so this uh, diversity is, is hard to do if the, if the inputs are kind of local and they're not replicated millions of times. Well, if the inputs are replicated everywhere, then the argument falls apart. I see, I see. Thanks. Okay, okay. Good question. Okay. Okay. Other, let's see. Other questions or comments? chance well okay maybe not uh, I guess that's the last chance or questions or comments um, okay otherwise thank you again for a very nice talk and for uh, showing places where we can get more bounds I guess and so forth so that's that's good so appreciate it very much so thank you again okay so, thanks for inviting me okay. thank you okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, All right. Bye. Okay, bye bye. So this is our only speaker this morning. So uh, we'll end early today. So uh, thank you very much. Okay.
Thanks, Les. That was that was good. Appreciate your comment.